Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Yesterday I did a presentation that focused on the plasmac, which is a form of, in my view, an exotic vacuum object, and the way to make that, uh, effectively a very large ball lightning, uh, and to control it based on a patent uh, that was awarded in the early 1970s and which is now expired and I cross-correlated a number of things that have been observed between our work and other authors work and that work uh, which adds uh, some sort of uh, coherence. Now I wanted to come back to the cookbook in the signal. Uh, this is what we call signal uh, and this uh, uh, recipe as it were that was uh, presented at that time because there's several things that I want to draw out, uh, which I think are relevant now, uh, and I'm going to do a series of videos uh, in addition to this one, uh, for those people that are attempting Mizuno replications uh, to really understand what are important temperatures uh, to be able to uh, both activate material and stimulate it according to what has been observed by ourselves and other authors. Anyway, so as I was saying yesterday, um, we uh, went through a process to basically clean the nickel uh, of any oxides. So we're baking the nickel, we're reducing the nickel, that's obviously with hydrogen, and then we're trying to hydrogenate the nickel. Uh, and then what we did is that actually at that point we took the, the nickel out and we uh, mixed it in an argon glove, glove box uh, with some lithium aluminium hydride. And this was uh, following the uh, patent disclosure from uh, Andrea Rossi and some uh, additional lithium to try and match his uh, uh, patent formula. And then uh, we then baked uh, and vacked the reactor uh, and we added the mix and uh, uh, we vacked it after warming it up, added the H2O and so on. And then th this is the rest of the procedure. And uh, the key point here is we wanted to keep uh, below the, the Curie temperature and uh, the reason is specifically that uh, due to donors which were very generous we were able to go and visit uh, uh, Francesco Piantelli in January this occurred in the February um, and uh, we were told by him that you need to do everything this part of the process below the Curie temperature and so we operated the reactor for a period of time below the Curie temperature uh, and then uh, we took the pressure down and then we went as fast as possible through the nickel Curie temperature. Essentially what I talked about there at the beginning was that uh, Thomas Graham FRS said you must clean the metal before hydrogen occlusion. So that's what I've just been talking about and if we look at what Parkmob did he uh, prepared by um, uh, vacuum pumping this is what we did in our recipe uh, then he uh, added hydrogen and uh, uh, and then kept that at 350 degrees c look at that temperature the 350 degrees c for three hours to clean the surface of the nickel granules after this a secondary pumping out of the gas was done to remove water resulting from the reduction of the nickel so this is exactly as we described in the recipe uh, then the reactor was refilled with hydrogen to a pressure close to atmospheric and kept for three days. So this is to hydrogenate the nickel. So again, it's as we pres prescribed in that recipe. And then repeated the uh, hydrogenation and vacuum cycle a couple of times. Uh, and that was effectively preparing it. So in many respects, uh, what he did in his 225 day reactor is exactly what we are prescribing here. Now, I, I went into his data a little bit more, um, and I hadn't spotted this before, but I'm going to tell you now. Um, and, and that is, um, uh, if you look at uh, his uh, data here for his uh, temperature profile, so he, he, he says here, once, once you've done the pre-processing, he moves it to the main workstation. And in the main workstation, which you can see a picture here, uh, in the main workstation, this is the temperature profile he gave that I presented at ICCF 22 in 2019. And essentially, he, you can see he's heating it up and he stops and, and changes direction at somewhere between 300 and 400 degrees. What is that? I am absolutely certain that that is the Curie temperature. So he's effectively doing exactly what we described in this uh 
uh, recipe, as it were. We held at 340 degrees uh, C because we wanted to make sure that the internal temperature uh, wasn't above the Curie temperature. Now, what is the Curie temperature for nickel? The Curie temperature for nickel is 354 degrees. We are keeping it uh, at our temperature of 340 degrees C. That's as, as much as we wanted to get close to it. He, uh, in his uh, process that he's describing, which I will get to here, uh, he's keeping it at 350 degrees C. Now, his particular um, reactor, he, he's able to measure the temperature much more accurately uh, because he's actually got the thermocouple uh, inside the heater coil. And so, in theory, the, the temperature is all the same. So he's able to get it as close as possible. And that's exactly what we're saying here. Get as close as you can comfortably get to the Curie temperature. And what is going on at the Curie temperature? Well, effectively, at the Curie temperature... What's going on is, uh, if, if we look here, um, it's, it's the temperature at which the magnetic domains go from one form of magnetism to another. And it's also a, uh, a, a, a state in which uh, there is a phase change in the material. Uh, and to demonstrate it, there's this uh, diagram here where uh, they have a heater and there's a, a nickel ball here. And they're heating it and it's attached to some magnets. And what happens is when it goes up the Curie temperature, it just swings away on the pendulum. So there's a very marked uh, uh, effect when it goes to the Curie temperature. And it's this uh, temperature, which I believe um, is the uh, temperature at which uh, a very key part of the process goes. And which I, I believe, um, whilst... Uh, in fact, in, in this particular blog, we shared the video that we were given by Piantelli down here, uh, where he's actually talking about uh, uh, the fact that the, the occlusion that, or the, the, the absorption of the hydrogen goes on between uh, 300 and uh, 400 degrees C. But I actually think that it's actually at this uh, phase change, this magnetic state change in the nickel where you get the actual uh, uh, key part of the process happening. And so um, if you go back up, up, up to the top, so effectively what we've got is um, both uh, uh, ourselves and Parkamov. This, this um, as you will see, if we go in here, um, basically, uh, in, in January of 2015, as part of Project Fedora, Fentelli said, you must prepare below the Curie, then you go through the Curie temperature quickly. And then Parkamov told us that you must be over 1,000 degrees, ideally 1,100 degrees C, for the Lena process to begin. Now, in February of 2015, uh, we had this thing called bang. Now, we were doing a thermal validation of the dog bone, the uh, classic uh, hot cat uh, reactor. And uh, from uh, calibration and measurement, uh, the actual bang occurred at 1100 degrees C. Now, let's show you that data. So, just a couple of things here. This, this is the reactor. And we have a, a Williamson IR pyrometer pointing here, and here is a thermocouple, which is a K-type thermocouple on the other side, and I'll show you an image of that. And then in this uh, sheath here, we have a B-type thermocouple, which is in the same position approximately as the uh, Williamson IR, but on the inside between this alumina sheath and uh, the uh, central core sheath. Now, if we actually look at the reverse of that, we can see here where the K-type thermocouple is on. This is the spot from the Williamson IR on the reverse. And uh, that is where all our temperature measurements are coming from. Now, I'm just going to play the bang event and then we'll talk about it. You, all, the links, all the links will be in the description to the video as usual. Yes, because um, at some point we're going to have some molten lithium in there. Yeah. Not sure I want that or even vapor lithium coming at us, so perhaps we should uh, <clears throat> retire to a different distance or already flying particles is kind of what I had in mind. I can hide behind the monitor here, but maybe Ryan, you should have where you're sitting is probably easier since you're in the yeah, line I can of wrap fire. around here. <clears throat> We're just erecting a uh, Blast shield uh, out of respect. We gotta try and 
I'm going to do the uh, infrared camera filter thing. Okay, ready? It looks a bit like this. Ready? It looks a bit like this. <laughs> now the photos I've taken look pretty much bang on. So <clears throat> we'll get those over to you soon at some point. So the Williamson is already reading 1027 degrees or approximately. <clears throat> And on the chart here, we're seeing 952. It's interesting, the K-type and that. Are they nearer together now? I think they are. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 797 to 834. So about 38 degrees difference. And now it's 927 to 956. Counter doing not a lot. Well, that was exciting. Ah, uh, did you hear it? Was the shield a good idea? The shield <laughs> was a good idea. The shield was a good idea. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh, oh, mama. We have no silicon carbide element. <laughs> and we have a vaporized reactor. So, was that a runaway reaction? We were in the domain of Parkamov. Well, at least we know we had pressure. Yeah. yeah, but we shouldn't have had pressure at that temperature. Well, no, the last, if it, there. Oh my, that was exciting. <laughs> oh, oh. oh, guys, that vaporized. It utterly, utterly vaporized. Well, time to go take some closer up pictures. Um, hold on, just bear in mind there's lithium malamillium hydride around. So perhaps we should uh, open a few doors first. I think probably. Wouldn't hurt. Anybody know what that is supposed to smell like? Uh, death. <laughs> oh. So uh, that was the uh, bang experience. It's part of a, a very, very long video, but this is the segment uh, which I think is most interesting. A couple of things I want to draw your attention to. The external thermal couple goes up to about a thousand degrees C and then drops off precipitously. And if we actually look at uh, uh, this, this is the debris, this is the material we saw. So if we look at the video here, and we look at uh, a little bit before the actual bang occurred. So, uh, did you hear it? 1052.36 <laughs> is the measurement point. So 1052.36 is the measurement point before the bang occurred. And if we go to this article on infinite energy. This is a graph from the calibration of the silicon carbide heater. And if we go up to where we have a, a temperature of 1000 and uh, just over 1050 here, the actual temperature in the core is a, a, a little bit over 1100 degrees centigrade. So whilst we're only reading uh, here 1052, the actual uh, potential temperature inside the actual core was in excess of 1,100 degrees centigrade. And so what we have here is the uh, bang from calibration and measurement went off at over 1,100 degrees C. Uh, and what happened when we looked at that, uh, uh, it, we sent it off to Ed Storms at Kiva Labs, and he very kindly did an analysis of it, and this is what came out of it. And basically, the lithium aluminium hydride, uh, the residual of that, had coated the uh, Vale 225, T225 nickel. 
uh, with this kind of wetted to, to the nickel surface. And Alexander Parkhamov decided to stop using lithium aluminium hydride because uh, he saw that, you know, it did this and uh, it was removing the active structures on the uh, carbonyl nickel uh, that are able to produce the uh, um, the uh, uh, type of hydrogen, in my understanding, or allow the nickel to be absorbing the hydrogen uh, because it's coated in, in this stuff. And I actually think a fundamental error uh, or assumption error was made when doing these experiments. I actually believe, as at one point it was suggested, that a pill was inserted into the reactor to enable uh, hydrogen to be produced within the reactor. And it may actually be the case that that was exactly what Rossi was describing. Rather than mixing the powders together, the... Um, the, the, there was a pill of the, the, the prepared nickel and there was a pill of uh, uh, lithium aluminium hydride plus lithium. And this allowed you to heat it up and uh, uh, produce some uh, um, uh, uh, hydrogen and then uh, cool it down uh, uh, and uh, it would reabsorb it. So you could cycle it, but it wouldn't do this. So I think actually uh, Parkhamov moved on to just using... Uh, nickel rather than uh, doing the mix that we put into this uh, system here but I think you could get away with a system where uh, for instance if you can imagine that this was kind of like a, a cold trap or a, a some desiccant in there like silica gel and that hung off one side of the reactor then you had your reactor here um, you could uh, uh, have a non-vacuum system where you had your heater coil it heated up these two pills. Uh, one of the pills uh, has uh, it's in a like stainless steel container with the lithium aluminium hydride and the extra lithium. That is able to do proton conduction through it, producing atomic hydrogen or, or at least hydrogen coming through and reforming on, on, on the surface. So you'll just get pure hydrogen that then goes into your prepared nickel. And in fact, you wouldn't necessarily need to prepare the nickel. You could have the nickel in there uh, heat this up, cool it down, heat this up, cool it down. And if any water is produced, it would then come down and get trapped in the desiccant that's over here in the cold part of the cell. So you could end up with an environment where you can bake out the cell, you can reduce the nickel, you can hydrogenate the nickel, and uh, uh, you can keep the lithium and aluminium away from the nickel so that you are just effectively doing a Piantelli experiment with the temperature going through the D by temperature of 353 degrees for nickel at the critical point and doing all of this be uh, um, before that uh, and then taking it up to this 1100 degrees plus temperature which it would appear that uh, Parkhamov told us this uh, before we ran the bang experiment. It was over 1,100 degrees centigrade that we had the bang. Now I want to come back to the signal uh, experiment and uh, talk about that a little bit more. So here we here we are with the signal, um, uh, and there's a couple of things. Um, I, I talked about the fact that. Uh, uh, Barkler had discovered this what he called J radiation uh, in the early 1910s um, and uh, he spent the rest of his life after getting the Nobel Prize for discovering um, characteristic x-rays he, he, he spent trying to work out what J radiation was anyway it's saying here in this paper that we um, I think it was uh, ICCF 19 or something anyway um, it says, for several years, Rossi has said that the ECAP produces low-level gamma radiation, mostly 50 to 100 kV. Well, we observed that in Signal. But this is Defcalion's uh, thing, and they're saying that they observe gamma radiation below 300 kiloelectron volts. Well, we observed gamma radiation, at least the majority of it, below 300 kiloelectron volts. And I went on to say that this is iron. Iron's quite important as a, uh, as, as a material. But when you looked at the volume and... Uh, you did the calculations. I can't get to this link anyway, but I did the calculations in a video. The actual volume of the material and the lead uh, corresponded to something that you would want to use to shield 300 keV um, gamma rays and uh, to thermalize them. And the other thing is that I noticed here 
uh, that this actual uh, patent wafer configuration is very similar to where Parkamov is now. You've got the heater in the middle, you've got something around it, and then you have um, the actual fuel area separate, separated out. So there will be a thermal gradient between this and this is uh, running at a temperature. And the interesting thing is that I identified again in this blog that um, uh, in an interview with Ruby Carrot on um, the 12th of March 2012, uh, Rossi did actually say that the ECAT low temperature runs at 1,500 degrees C internally. Wow. So at that point, your your lead here is a liquid. Um, then it kind of precludes certain choices in here. But the actual, this would be the internal, internal, internal bit. This is heated to 1,500 degrees C. This is at the temperature at which... Uh, Alexander Parkamov in this book Space Earth Human describes why you need to be over 1000 degrees but at least, uh, actually ideally above 1100 degrees and he does it with maths and uh, the reasons why because that produces the cold neutrinos and the cold neutrinos can then go on and interact uh, with uh, uh, the other materials and in, in my case I'm, I'm suggesting that it is this dense hydrogen and so the other the other point that's actually here, and it's been sitting here for a very long time, is the use of the catalyst potassium. Now, I do not believe that potassium is a true catalyst in this instance. Uh, it is playing the role that I have given both potassium and carbon in these experiments uh, 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 in a presentation I gave with, with, with regard to uh, a lot of the decisions I've been making over the last couple of years. Um, Potassium uh, obviously has potassium-40 in it, and uh, potassium-40 uh, can be triggered by the uh, uh, low uh, uh neutrinos that are synthesized uh, to produce a highly ionizing uh, um, uh, beta particle uh, from m almost all of its decays. And, and actually, I, I suggested it, but then when I read in October... Parkamov is saying that potassium could be the fuel of the future. So you effectively have um, potassium being called a catalyst, but I don't think it is. I think you've got a, 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 a little thing that then causes the decay of the potassium, and the potassium then uh, accelerates the process. Now, uh, as we uh, understand, there is no potassium in the Parkamov 225-day uh, reactor, um, uh, and uh, the other thing is then, for, therefore, um, I want to uh, fixate on here, is that here we go to, uh, he goes straight the way through the Curie temperature, where I believe you're forming your uh, atomic hydrogen, or the atomic hydrogen here, but then the, the, the ultra-dense hydrogen here. Um, and then uh, he takes it up to here, and this is 1,100 degrees C, uh, and he then shoots up. And then when he comes down to the temperature at which he had, that at 1,100 degrees C with the input power, it's the same input power as where he's at 1,100 degrees C. You can see after he returns, he's seeing an excess of about 80 watts. So you are getting uh, 80 watts over a 400 uh, watt input. So here you are seeing something that is uh, consistent with the other experiments. So effectively, uh, 2016 February, the MFMP signal excess heat turned on at 1,040 degrees C on the outside temperature. Excess against control grew higher as time at this temperature uh, and higher paths. So here we have the traces, and if you look, when we get five, six, seven, eight, this is where we have this massive uh, beta burst. And if we go back up to the uh, input power and, and uh, sort of the supposed excess determination, um, what you can see is that in seven, it, just before seven, is where we first go to a temperature where the external temperature on the active uh, reactor uh, is uh, about 1,030 degrees. But internally, that will be closer to... Uh, 1,100 degrees and you can imagine that the power is on um, and uh, maybe it takes a bit of time to 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 settle um, and that might be indicated by the pressure going up here so the pressure is going up as uh, the the temperature is there so there's th there's definitely something that takes a bit of time to settle out but it's kind of practically settled when you get to the seven uh, uh, sample uh, uh, point change 
And then you can see that uh, uh, this is where we have this peak and then we have a residual peak over here. But what's going on is the, the green line, which is the active uh, reactor, uh, goes from being underneath, which it was in every other part of uh, the experiment, to getting up and being in line uh, with the null side of the reactor. And so what we see is this kind of uh, sort of no net difference between the various parts of the reactor as it goes up and down. But then we get to this point and it starts to creep up and it starts to creep up. And every time the temperature goes up to what may be over 1,100 uh, degrees internally, um, it spikes up the, the uh, amount that the active is running over the, the uh, null until we get up to here and here, and then we put it up to uh, the uh, external temperature is uh, where it is um, 1,100 degrees. So it's well over 1,100 degrees internally at this point. And we start to go quite a lot above that. Uh, and so the difference between here, where it's at uh, this uh, input power uh, and temperature, uh, we can see that this is 10 degrees above. Whereas down here, before the onset of the signal, um, it's 20 degrees below. So it's actually shifted so that the, uh, the active side is 30 degrees uh, hotter than it ordinarily was than the, the null side. So um, it would appear that excess heat is effectively only turning on uh, when we uh, uh, get over 1,100 degrees and before that occurred, you had this major event and uh, uh, you had this, uh, what we called the signal. So if we go back to here, here we have uh, the signal where it's likely that the internal temperature was over 1100 degrees C. And it's at that point that we have uh, the excess being produced. Now I want to go back to the uh, Parkamov reactor. And if we look at the Parkamov reactor, with the Parkamov reactor again, he goes to 1,100 degrees C, and that's when he's looking for his excess, and he pulls that back down to the same power, and you can see these 80 watts over an input power um, of uh, uh, 40, uh, 400 watts. So there you have it. Um, we have uh, all of these devices look like there is a trigger temperature of uh, somewhere between uh, the, the late uh, 1000 and somethings and uh, 1100 degrees plus. Uh, and then if you um, we go back to uh, Lion uh, from 2018 uh, when I shared that work in January, um, we didn't know that the temperature was about 1080 degrees internally. As I said yesterday, um, the actual temperature we thought was around about 850, say. Um, but actually, later on, it, it came out that it was about 1080 degrees C. Um, and so we have a wide range of different reactors. And in each case, they were um, heating up uh, slowly and uh, um, uh, there was an effort to um, uh, do that first part of the process very carefully. And then they went uh, over 1000 degrees C. And so the justification for that is in here. Now, when, when um, uh, Parkamov told us here in 2015 that we needed to be ideally at around about uh, 1100 degrees C plus, uh, he didn't explain why. Um, uh, and so <laughs> uh, we now know why, what the logic is for him suggesting that. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, we had to wait until late 2019 before we knew why in 2015 he was telling us to do that. But in, in the interim, we have two experiments from ourselves and one from Parkamov and uh, one from uh, Lyon. Uh, and Lyon's done several replications uh, where um, uh, the, the <laughs> was exhibiting this uh, necessity to go over 1,100 degrees C. And moreover, um, when we did not go uh, uh, over 1,080 or 1,100 degrees C in our Lyon replication, we did not see excess heat. 
And also, if you look at uh, Parkamov's uh, particular uh, data here, he calibrated up to 1,000 degrees C um, because uh, uh, if he went beyond there, he would have started to activate the reactor. So he calibrated up to 1,000 degrees C. He ran it for his 210 to 25 days, and then he ran the temperature up and down uh, afterwards in post-calibration, showing that it fitted the same curve. But the actual excess heat, when it hits 1,000 degrees C, it sort of immediately starts going off. And so uh, here we have, uh, you know, if you can imagine uh, when we were running our line replication, we were down here, so there was no excess heat uh, and nothing really interesting going on because the, the excess heat is a, is, a, is a symptom of the broader process of Lena that's going on. And uh, when we came up to here in our bang, it went bang. Uh, when we went in signal, when we, we did it, uh, it, we went up to here and we started to see excess heat. All of these data points are lining up. And so again, go through the sum summary. You must clean the metal before uh, hydrogen occlusion, according to Thomas Graham, uh, FRS from 1868. Then you must do everything of your, do your cleaning uh, below the Curie temperature and your hydrogenation whilst the nickel is in uh, its kind of catalytic, catalytic state. And then you must go over, let's say, 1,100 degrees C to start building the cold neutrinos, as is calculated in this book, and so forth. And that starts uh, activating the process. And if we go back to um, the cookbook is in the signal, um, there is this potassium here that's mentioned, and as well as un other unknown ingredients is required. I suspect that that could be carbon, because carbon was found in both the, uh, the ash and uh, the uh, uh, source, I believe, from the Lugana reactor. I've talked about how carbon in the right form can also be an active uh, participant in the reaction. And I suggest that also maybe palladium was in there as well in some small amount. Uh, because it's just better at getting the hydrogen uh, and capturing it and then uh, releasing it in the form that then nickel can uh, process in the active form. But pa Parkamov and uh, Piantelli has shown us that that's not necessary. So um, uh, what we can take away then is uh, if you are building a Mizuno experiment, um, I would advise that you do some thermal modelling to see that your nickel mesh is... Uh, uh, during its uh, bake-out and hydrogenation does not go above 353 degrees centigrade, the Curie temperature of nickel. And so you do all your, your cleaning and stuff uh, down this end, and then you rapidly go through, and somehow you've got to be able to get your uh, nickel uh, at uh, the uh, to into the, uh, the where it needs to be active to uh, excess of 1,100 degrees C, and so uh, these are the parameters that I think uh, you need to consider moving forward. I would suggest p p possibly adding some potassium salts in there um, uh, as a what it, what is determined by Defcalion Green Technologies as a catalyst that was also in Rossi's uh, Hot Cats, according to them. I don't believe it's acting truly as a catalyst. I believe it is uh, responding to the cold neutrinos and uh, that that is producing an ability uh, to produce these 1.45 or whatever it is, uh, uh, mega electron volt uh, beta particles that can do some ionization. And in an up and coming video, I will talk about uh, the importance of the ionization and how that is not just uh, um, what one would normally imagine uh, from ionization and how that plays into the overall uh, uh, new fire uh, reaction. And uh, again, to, to recap, uh, this uh, uh, form of reactor is more similar to the form of reactor that uh, is the um, current uh, Parkamov design, uh, although he's gone a little bit further. And it's also quite similar in actual structure to the uh, Mizuno reactor, where you have the hottest part in the middle, and then you have your fuel effectively uh, a, a little bit spaced away. So you can kind of almost imagine it being a similar thing. And so uh, there you have it. Uh, it's a multi-stage process, but really, and, and to just recap again, he said that in 2012, uh, uh, 
uh, in 12th of March that the ECAT low temperature runs at 1500 degrees centigrade internally. And these are the kind of temperatures that Parkamov was achieving. And you can imagine that, uh, well, I, I think uh, if you look at the, the calculations in here, you will see that a large, a much larger proportion of the uh, solid material in the reactor is uh, synthesizing. So that's the, the, the part here would be synthesizing the cold neutrinos at 1500 degrees than would occur at 1100 degrees. And, and this is kind of reflected by our own data uh, from um, uh, from uh, the uh, signal uh, thing. So we, we only go from an external temperature of 1050 to 1100, but we see a big jump in the uh, uh, implied excess heat here. So you can imagine as you ramp that up to 1500 degrees, as is uh, uh, supposedly going on in the center here, that the excess heat would be far higher. Um, and, uh, you know, that's also re reflected uh, in the work of uh, uh, Parkamov, um, where he is, uh, as you go up here, you're getting far more excess power as you uh, increase the, the, the input power, increasing the, 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 the main temperature. So there, there it is. So thank you very much for your time. And uh, if you have any questions, do let me know. Um, but here we have a whole series of data where our experiments in between and the experiments of others and even of Parkamov himself, before it was made knowledge that it made the knowledge was made available that there's this critical temperature and the reason why that critical temperature uh, uh, triggers the effect, um, uh, uh, we had all of these experiments uh, uh, showing that this uh, occurs uh, over this specific temperature. So thank you very much for your time and I'll see you in the next video.